Welcome to this video series about measuring value creation in private equity, where we precisely quantify the impact of cranking up leverage in a private equity deal. My name is Mike Reinard. I've worked in the industry for over 15 years. I wrote the book, Private Equity Value Creation Analysis, and I run the Auxilia Mathematica and ValueBridge.net websites. These videos cover findings from my work, and they are designed for private equity practitioners who use data to raise capital or evaluate the returns of private equity deals, funds, GPs, and investment programs. If it's helpful to you, subscribe and check out the website where you can download Excel files behind every episode. This is video number 14 in the value creation series. In the last few videos, we discussed how to measure market forces on value drivers like revenue growth and multiple expansion. And now we will tackle gearing, which is the degree to which debt amplifies equity gains and losses. One of the ways that limited partners try to evaluate private equity returns is with public market equivalents or PME. But that doesn't work when private equity deals have materially different capital structures than the public companies that make up an index. For example, here's a public company where debt makes up 20% of the capital structure and a private equity deal where debt makes up 60% of the capital structure. If both companies double total enterprise valuation, the first will increase its equity value by 125%, while the second will increase its equity value by 250%. This difference is driven by gearing or the leverage effect, and any attempt to use PME to understand investment manager skill or operational value add will be confounded by these dynamics. So to get around that, we need to find a way to normalize the impact of leverage, and I believe that there are two reasonable ways of doing it. The first is the hard way, a method that's found in academic and industry literature. It requires the analyst to unlever the cash flows for both the private equity company and the index, and then make appropriate comparisons to determine the return driven by the market, excess leverage, and private equity alpha. The approach was developed in 2013 by Professor Viral Acharya of NYU, and other studies that rely on it include this 2015 paper by Pantheon and this 2016 paper by KPMG. You can find links to these studies in the video description and on the episode page. The math that underlies these models is similar to what we describe as the Munich model of value creation in video VC103, and I'll demonstrate how that math works later in this video. Our next option is the easy way. It's built on the value bridges described in the book and on the Auxilia Mathematica and valuebridge.net websites. We'll jump into it right now. Here is a value bridge where we break the company's total equity value creation into revenue growth, EBITDA margin expansion, valuation multiple expansion, cash flow generation, and gearing. Revenue growth is the change in revenue times the average holding period EBITDA margin, valuation multiple, and equity ratio. EBITDA margin expansion is the change in the EBITDA margin times the average holding period revenue, valuation multiple, and equity ratio. Multiple expansion is the change in the valuation multiple times the average holding period EBITDA and equity ratio. Cash flow generation is minus the change in net debt. And gearing is equal to the change in the company's total enterprise valuation times the average holding period debt ratio. Now, note that these first three value drivers are already unlevered because the equations contain the average holding period equity ratio. This means that, unlike with PME, we can use these equations to compare companies that have different capital structures. The equity ratio is the value of total shareholder equity divided by total enterprise valuation. And to get the holding period average, you simply add up the values at entry and exit and then divide by two. Next, we have cash flow generation, and this has absolutely nothing to do with leverage. It just measures how much debt or cash on the balance sheet changes over the holding period. If you wish, you can break cash flow generation into several other value drivers, including interest payments, the debt tax shield, maintenance capex, whatever, but I don't think that's worth our time. This number is already downstream from all the GP or management team's financing decisions, so we might as well just give them credit or blame for the result. Positive value creation like we see here comes from paying down debt or accumulating cash on the company's balance sheet. That's capital that could have been distributed to the shareholders during the holding period, but wasn't for one reason or another. Effectively, it's an equity distribution that shareholders receive on the last day of the holding period. Negative cash flow generation would come from increasing debt or burning through cash. That's capital that was required to maintain the company's enterprise valuation, so it is effectively a support equity investment that gets deducted from the equity proceeds when you sell the company. The last item on the chart is the value driver for gearing, which tells us how much debt amplified equity gains and losses. The debt ratio is the net debt divided by the total enterprise valuation, and the average is just the sum of the value at entry and exit divided by two. It also happens to always be equal to 100% minus the average holding period equity ratio. Now, compared to what we'll see in the academic and industry models, this gearing formula is extremely simple. 
and it lets us calculate what the gearing would have been if the company had a different capital structure. Let's say that a typical public company in the sector has an average debt ratio of 20% instead of the higher values that we find in private equity deals. We can define this value as the sector debt ratio, or SDR, and then define the excess debt ratio, or XDR, as the difference between the sector debt ratio and the company's average debt ratio as follows. This lets us split up gearing into two new value drivers. Sector gearing is what would have occurred if the company had a capital structure similar to the typical sector peer, and excess gearing tells us how much extra gearing occurred because of those different leverage levels. Now, if we're looking for something that's similar to PM8, we might split revenue growth into addressable market growth and market share growth, as we did in VC113, and we might split multiple expansion into market multiple expansion and intrinsic multiple expansion, as we did in VC112. Technically, we can do the same thing with EBITDA margin expansion, but it's harder to find meaningful long-term data on EBITDA margins, so I think it's easier to just give the GP full credit or full blame for whatever happens with this value driver. At this point, we can rearrange the value creation components. We can add up addressable market growth, market multiple expansion, and sector gearing, and call that the market-driven return. This is very close to what you would get if you invested in a basket of public securities in the sector. And then we could add up everything that's left and call that the manager-driven return, and that would be a proxy for the private equity GP's financial and operational value add. Now, on this chart, the manager-driven return includes excess gearing, but perhaps you don't want to give them credit for that since additional leverage comes with additional risk. Well, that's no problem. We could just pull out excess gearing like this, leaving us three value creation components, one market-driven value driver, one for the company being more levered than the typical sector peers, and the manager-driven return, which now includes market share growth, EBITDA margin expansion, intrinsic multiple expansion, and cash flow generation. The main point is that we can group these value drivers in any way that we wish, and then using the math we describe in video VC106, convert them into the other units of value creation. To get a times money value creation measurement, we divide all these value drivers by invested capital. To get a relative percent value creation measurement, instead of dividing by invested capital, we divide by the change in total equity value. To get equity return multipliers, we raise the deal's multiple of invested capital to the power of relative value creation. And then to get a value creation IRR, we raise the equity return multipliers to the power of 1 over the effective holding period and subtract 100%. If you want more detail on this, check out the episode page and go back and watch video VC106. So that is what we call the easy way. Let us compare it to the hard way. Acharya's 2013 paper assumes that you could model the company and sector returns like a weighted average cost of capital. We say that the unlevered IRR is equal to the equity ratio times the equity IRR plus the debt ratio times 1 minus the corporate tax rate times the weighted average cost of debt. Next, you rearrange the equity ratio and debt ratio terms to get a common denominator as follows. And this gives us the equation that's used in the academic and industry studies. We will use this formula for our private equity deal and change the color to blue so we don't lose track of the terms. In green, we'll do the same thing with the returns of the sector, where IRR sequity will be the sector equity return, IRR sunlev will be the unlevered sector return, SDE will be the sector's debt to equity ratio, ST will be the sector tax rate, and RSD will be the average cost of debt to companies in the sector. These two equations form the basis of the academic models, so let's consider the numbers that we'll need to plug into these formulas. IRR equity is just the total equity IRR for the private equity deal. It's probably pretty close to the gross IRR on a GP's quarterly report or fundraising deck, although that may be a little bit off due to dilution of certain shareholders in the equity stack. The debt to equity ratio is something you may be able to estimate from capital structure data in a GP's marketing or reporting materials. Just note that the value changes when companies pay down debt, so you'll need to take an average of the entry and exit values. The company's weighted average cost of debt is probably something you'll need to estimate. Academic studies admit that they rarely have a real number for this. They usually just plug in LIBOR plus 300 basis points for the year that the deal was completed. Similarly, the tax rate is usually estimated from the location. For the sector equity returns, researchers typically use an annualized return from an index. Alternatively, you could take a PME type approach where you invest the private equity deal's cash flows into an index and measure the resulting IRR. That would be more accurate, but it would require more data and more work. You can estimate the sector tax rate from the company locations. 
But for the sector debt to equity ratio and the sector weighted average cost of debt, you probably need to build a comp set to analyze the companies that make up the index. Here, you likely need to leverage a commercial data provider like S&P Capital IQ, Bloomberg, or PitchBook. All right, once you have gathered all this data, we can get to work. We let the private equity deal's total equity return equal the sum of 1. Private equity alpha, which is equal to the difference between the unlevered return for the private equity deal and the unlevered return for the sector. 2. The sector equity return, which of course includes the impact of sector leverage. And 3. Excess leverage, which is the difference between the private equity deal's leverage-driven outperformance and the sector's leverage-driven outperformance. Now, you can prove that this is mathematically correct because each of these terms cancel out, giving you the private equity deal's total equity return that we started with. This does not always guarantee that an analysis is meaningful. There are many ways to make meaningless value drivers add up to the correct number, but I don't think that's the case here. The math is intuitive and it makes sense. The main drawback here is how complicated the formulas become. When you expand everything, you see that the private equity alpha formula is no treat, but that excess leverage formula, as defined in the 2013 Acharya paper, wow, that's even worse. This is quite a departure from the value bridge model, where excess gearing was just the change in the company's enterprise valuation times the excess debt ratio. Other considerations include the fact that many of these numbers are difficult to find, so they must be estimated, and that unlevered IRR formula that underlies everything in the analysis becomes volatile when companies are highly levered or when they experience large changes in debt. We won't prove that here, but go back to video VC103 if you want to see how that plays out. All in all, we highly recommend you take the easier path and use a value bridge to estimate the equity gains driven by excess gearing or excess leverage. Not only will you get a more robust and reliable model that requires less data, you will get more value drivers to play with so you can customize it to whatever project that you're working on. This was one of the more technical videos in the series, so thanks for sticking through it. I only covered the derivative model formulas for gearing, sector gearing, and excess gearing in the video, but you can find the logarithmic model formulas for those value drivers on the episode page at Auxilia Mathematica. If you're into this sort of thing, please like, subscribe, and check out all the private equity value creation videos on the website. Registration is free and gives you full access to downloadable Microsoft Excel templates, articles, white papers, online value creation calculators, and other content. Now, if you need to get models like this set up in a hurry, perhaps for a GP annual meeting presentation or a manager due diligence project, I encourage you to check out valuebridge.net. This is a new website that skips all the mathematical theories and proofs and gives you just what you need to build a defensible private equity return model in a couple of hours. At valuebridge.net, we break everything down into 40 efficient modules and you can filter by topic or value driver to find the one that best suits your needs. Every module includes a Microsoft Excel template, a short video that shows you exactly how to use it, and an online calculator that you can use to make sure that your model is giving you the right answers. It's designed to be a paint-by-numbers toolkit that takes all the guesswork out of the private equity value bridge. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you either at Auxilia Mathematica or valuebridge.net.